Welcome to This Generation. I'm your host, Bethany Stanley. On today's program, we travel to interior Alaska to the Yukon River, where we will visit a village that's taking an approach to education that's as unique as the village's name. Then it's off to southeast Alaska, where we will visit a high school that's keeping tradition alive while delivering a more conventional education. Don't go away. We'll be right back with more of This Generation and education the Native way. Each week, Heartbeat Alaska brings you great stories from all over the state. And we couldn't do it without the generous support of Frontier Flying Service. Frontier gets our camera crews where they need to go. So whenever you see a Frontier plane, give them a wave. Say hi from Northland. You might just be on Heartbeat Alaska. Frontier Flying Service, covering Alaska for over 50 years. One joint contains as much cancer-causing tar as four cigarettes. Marijuana, it's more harmful than we all thought. Welcome back. Imagine hunting caribou or trapping beaver to receive your high school diploma. Well, it's part of the curriculum at Russian Mission School. By focusing on tradition and subsistence activities, the faculty of this rural high school are helping to raise test scores as the students raise the bar. Perched on the side of a hill overlooking the mighty Yukon River sits the village of Russian Mission, a mostly Yupik Eskimo village with a history that stems back centuries. The first Russian American company fur trading post was established here in 1837. Twenty years later, in 1857, the first Russian Orthodox mission in interior Alaska was established. And in 1900, the village name was changed from Ekoimute, meaning people of the point, to its current day name, Russian Mission. The village's location on the Yukon River allows for barge and small boat travel during the summer. During the winter, however, the river serves as a highway between villages and a great place for manaking, or ice fishing. In fact, manaking is a way of life out here. The people of Russian Mission rely upon the fish, moose, rabbit, and waterfowl as a source of food. So much so that the school makes it a part of their curriculum to practice the native traditions and subsistence activities that have kept this rural village alive for centuries. This group of teenagers is spending a little time on the river where many holes have been drilled in the ice, allowing them to drop their line and bait into the pike-inhabited waters on the Yukon River. As you can see, the mighty Yukon is home for some mighty large pike. <laughs> That's the kind they catch up with, guys. At least they look like it. But manaking is just one of the activities that these kids partake in. Inside the school, students are busy preparing beaver hides for the tanning process and eventually will be making hats out of these hides. Not only are these youth learning how to tan these hides, but they are the ones who trap the beavers. Make sure you make, make the slide right here. Mm -hmm. For 
For these kindergarten students, learning how to make their very own dance fans is just the beginning of their education, an education that will eventually tie their two worlds together. Tying the different generations together is another story. Here in Russian Mission, the high school students are taking on that responsibility by teaching the elementary and kindergarten kids a little bit about the heritage through their song and dance. It's a unique form of education that has had outstanding results. Somewhat out of necessity, a few years ago, we, we met with the traditional council, city council, advisory school board, to look at the problem that Russian Mission had two big problems that stood out. One, worst attendance in the district, okay, uh, had a lot of kids who dropped out of school, and, um, and the test scores had fallen to about the lowest in the district. So things were not, were not good. Um, and when we looked at when kids dropped out, they were dropping out at 12 and 13 years old. Okay, some even younger. But they're dropping out basically junior high, they were saying enough and quitting. So we decided, you know, design a program that was more activity oriented to interest that age level, try to get those kids back in school. Um, and, uh, and also, as is going on with all the villages now, <clears throat> that you, um, you have a couple of generations now that don't know the subsistence skills because they're not being taught universally. And the other thing is, by the school system coming in, it interferes with those subsistence skills. Prime time for gatherings of fall and we tell the kids to go back to school. So they're missing that. Um, <clears throat> so we decided to meet the needs. One, um, there's some basic skills all kids should have, uh, and that is how to maintain themselves safely in this environment, but also then how to feed themselves in this environment. So that was a priority. Um, that worked in real nicely with getting an activity-oriented curriculum for 7th and 8th grade, which in any setting need more activity, you know, to keep them occupied. Um, so that, that's what, you know, helped us focus on 7th and 8th grade. The other thing is, is that traditionally kids about that age would have gone aside to begin to learn those adult, their adult roles. So the boys would have gone to the men's house. Okay, to be trained to be hunters, okay. um, and the women would have been assigned to the women to learn their task in life. Okay. So there would have been a division, but it would have been you know, to prepare for adulthood. And by schools coming in here, mostly just in the 1950s, we replaced that system, but we didn't replace it. We said instead of subsistence skills, come to learn to read and write. Okay. Um, and the problem with that is we've never, we've never given um, a real purpose for that in the village in terms of does reading and writing provide you more food? It's provided a few jobs. Has it provided enough jobs for our graduates? No, it is not. Do people who stay in the village then still need to subsist? And do they still need those skills? Yes. Have we helped with those? No. We've interfered with them. So it was a conscious decision to say, no, we need to be part of uh, the education for people to live well here. And living well here means, one, you know a few safety rules to keep yourself alive on the river and to keep yourself alive during the winter. That's fundamental. Okay, let's take care of those first. Uh, then you need some, some you know, wisdom, some knowledge on how to feed yourself with all these resources that are around you. We've got the best diet in the world, you know, on our doorstep. Uh, we need to know how to use that. And that's exactly what the teachers of this school are doing. In fact, Principal Mike Hall and local residents of the village take groups of students each year out into the wilderness to teach them some of the basic skills of survival in the rugged terrain of interior Alaska. In the fall, in August, uh, this last year, um, we acquired six canoes that we purchased and then, then borrowed some others and took all the junior high kids out for two weeks and the whole time was traveling by canoe. Uh, we established three camps, and each camp was a center on a different kind of subsistence activity. And one was primarily fishing and gathering berries. Another one was primarily hunting. Another one, uh, we took the kids up to set up a cabin that they would use as a, as a trapping center to go out and trap beaver during the winter time. And uh, they'd have to travel. We traveled about five or six miles on the first leg of the, the canoe trip. 
and set up two camps. And then the third camp was seven miles upstream, so they'd have to paddle up that. And they'd spend a few days up with me at that, building the cabin, checking out the beaver houses, measuring them for size, you know, marking them with location with GPS, and then we paddle back. So that, and then the next group would have to paddle up the seven miles into the cabin, spend their time there, you know, finish building it, and then travel back down. So that kept them busy for two weeks, it's just rotating between these different camps, focusing them on different aspects of subsistence. So they came out of there, some of them had never cut fish before, they'd cut fish. Um, some of them had, a lot, had not been to some of the berry picking sites that are traditional here, so now they've been to those. None of them had built a cabin before, um, and they were real proud. They got to construct two outhouses, and that was a big deal. So they now feel comfortable that, oh yeah, I can build a cabin. So there's, there's these skills that are now part of them, and they just think this is the way we are. For many of the students, it was their first time learning many of these skills, but for all of these students, it has been an education that will benefit them for the rest of their lives. In fact, this unique approach to schooling is already having tremendous results within the community. This is the big thing, is, is whenever you have uh, something like writing, kids will say, oh, I don't know what to write about. Okay. Or, or, and if it's something arbitrary, then they're not interested. But by taking the kids out, they have stories to tell. And we're still in a, a society that's an oral tradition. They're storytellers. Uh, so by giving the kids all these experiences, they became the storytellers. So when they get back, they've got something to write. Um, so on a creative level, that's fine. And what we, and what we know too is, is that the more they write, the better they're able to read because they're using vocabulary. For the youth, it is a connection to their surroundings and a connection to their culture. For the community of Russian Mission, it is a sense of security and reassurance that the youth of this village will never lose sight of their heritage. Kenai Peninsula College, part of UAA, and Alaska Christian College, working together for the future. For the first time, I really looked at my life like I held a mirror up to it, and I got to see who I really was. An opportunity to challenge yourself. It made me feel like I was at home. Small classes designed for your success. It's challenging, but it's not overwhelming. A quality education in a rural environment. We are definitely a family, <laughs> and everything that comes with it. Heartbeat wishes to thank Haglin Aviation Services Incorporated for making our stories possible. We travel on Haglin Aviation and we thank you for choosing them too. Haglin Aviation has been serving Alaskans in the bush for over 20 years. We fly Haglins all the time. Operating with 29 aircraft at eight stations across Alaska and servicing over 100 destinations daily. Haglin Aviation, your ticket to ride in rural Alaska. Be sure to catch Heartbeat Alaska right here on ARCS. Through practicing traditional activities, the youth of Russian Mission will be prepared to live a subsistence lifestyle if they choose to do so. But what about those who want to pursue a career outside their village in a world full of technology? At the opposite end of their spectrum, these youth are also learning a great deal about the outside world, the world of technology, computers, and other cultures. In fact, many of the youth of Russian Mission recently returned from a trip to Japan where they learned about the Asian culture and in turn shared their culture with a captivated audience of Japanese people. It's this exposure to other cultures, the practicing of their own culture, and an understanding of the world of technology outside their village that is making these young people well-rounded and prepared to face the challenges of tomorrow. On the high end, these kids grew up comfortable with computers. This is the generation that's had computers since they were in kindergarten, so they're comfortable with them. Um, they're real easy about taking all their information and putting together PowerPoint presentations. So they've done that. Um, they've presented these, uh, these presentations to the community. They've traveled to several different schools. They presented at the Native Educator Conference, and a group of them presented in Tokyo to an international uh, symposium on the environment there. So they're real adept with technology. Uh, they've also developed their own websites uh, through the, the language arts teacher, 
part of the project is present all these things, put their pictures together, uh, put their captions in, write their stories, and then they dump it on the website. Uh, so they've got an extensive website, you know, with, uh, with all their different adventures. Uh, they get comments on those. People write them, you know, send email to them, say, oh, I look at your website and want to know more about this. Uh, a lot of communication with the kids in Japan and with a, a couple of groups of kids in Israel about their website. Okay, and that's what the kids that got together with at the symposium. Uh, asking questions about their lifestyle. So, um, so the technology, and, and this is the, the part I find fun, is that technology does not threaten the culture. It's not going to bring changes that, that can eradicate the culture. What technology has done is sort of um, focus the kids on the culture and say, this is unique, this is a treasure, and the world wants to know. And we're able to do this because the world is accessible to them. So when they present themselves, everybody wants to find out about what these kids are doing. Everybody wants to know, you know, uh, the way they live. And um, so for 7th and 8th grade kids particularly, this is a huge boost as far as their sense of who they are and where they are in the world, because uh, technology offers them that link. <laughs> One more, Pete. One more for me. G-Rock Spall Production. And although the art of throwing pizzas may not be crucial to these high school students' futures, it is a lot of fun after a week of exams and tests. But don't be fooled, for there's a lesson to be learned here. And it's not just how to make a good pizza. Well, we're going to dig, how to make the pizzas, work it together, put them in the oven, and tomorrow we'll sit down and write a story about doing that with the pizzas. And then we'll make a web page for it and post it on the internet. Just something for the kids to do that's fun, especially after the exit exams and the benchmark testing. Get out and have some fun, it's a how-to thing. Today was my day, how to make pizza. Tomorrow, the students will go in groups and they'll give a speech on how to make something in the class and work it. So it's a little bit of everything. It's nothing real technical, but it's a fun activity and they still learn something from it. <laughs> pepperonis are all in the middle. I know, I put them around the side. For these teenagers, the short-term reward is a fresh, hot pizza for lunch while the long-term reward is learning a new skill that may someday come in handy. And whether it be learning about their culture or learning about their future, the youth of Russian Mission are learning about themselves. With the help of an outstanding staff of teachers and a unique approach to education, these kids are showing the world their pride and what it means to be Yupik Eskimo. Alaska, there are people working hard to make this a better place. There are people working to bring families and villages together, working to save lives, working to get you home. Grant Aviation, they'll get you home. This is Grant Fairbanks. He's a pretty nice guy. He's lived in Bethel a long time. He owns Brown Slough Bed and Breakfast. We have two, two bed and breakfasts, the North Building and the South Building. Uh, we have four rooms in each. Whenever we visit Bethel, we stay at Brown Slough and Grant serves us a great breakfast. Quiet atmosphere, it's homey, it's very clean, it's safe and secure. We'd like to thank Grant and the whole crew at Brown Slough Bed and Breakfast. Yeah? Tessa's mad at you. What's she mad at me about? You said you would play basketball with her. She said she'll never speak to you again. <laughs> Parents that are involved with their kids are more likely to help keep their kids away from drugs. Okay. <laughs> Nothing but that. <laughs> Now let's travel to Southeast Alaska, to Sitka, where we will find youth from across the state gathering in one high school to receive a unique education that can only be found here at Mount Edgecombe High School. Across the channel from Sitka on Japonski Island sits Mount Edgecombe High School, a mostly native school that serves students from across the state. 
It is a prestigious boarding school that focuses on the future of hundreds of kids while keeping them connected to their culture. One activity that you will find in most of the villages across the state, including here at Mount Edgecombe High School in Sitka, is the Native Youth Olympics, a competition today that is based upon traditional subsistence and hunting skills from the past. For Norman Tanuksuk of Chafornik, Alaska, it is a tradition that takes him back home. My favorite event is Alaskan high kick, seal hop, one foot, and how you do one arm. Um, you have to keep your hand, one of your hand on the bottom. You know, on your other hand, you gotta hold the opposite side of the leg. Right. With the right hand to the left leg, and then with the left leg, you gotta jump with it, snap it, and kick the ball. For Eva Dixon of Teller, competing in the Native Youth Olympics is an opportunity she jumps at. It reminds me of like being at home because during the Christmas vacation, we have Eskimo games and I work, but I really don't participate because I'm working. And it just reminds me of being at home and I was in NYO since junior high. Other activities for the kids include drumming and dancing, a common event that takes place in many rural communities across the state. It's not merely an activity to pass the time away, it's a reminder of who they are and where they came from. In this case, it's a kind of revival for the Aleut kids who are attending Mount Edgecombe this year. This is our first alley dance group since a long time ago, and that group didn't last long, so this is our first year, our alley dance group. I think our culture, the alley culture, is the fastest dying culture, and I think of it as a privilege to be out here, you know, dancing and showing our culture, because um, there's the AFN, and I know there's a lot of people there in AFN, but to come this far south, down to sick up, it's, um, it's a good opportunity to be down here to share our culture with other people. I think the pride in their culture that they come here with and the talent they come here with and their willingness to share their culture with so many people, with the, um, the new students they meet here and when they get to practicing, they perform in town a lot and if they have an opportunity to travel, we do fundraising with them or find opportunities like the Alaska Native Heritage Center um, where they can get their expenses paid to go up and perform up there. So they, they work hard and they share and they teach each other the culture and they get rewarded for it and that's inspiring for me. That makes any amount of hours I work worth it to see them come in to dance practice and get happy. They could come in at first and be depressed about um, too much homework, being homesick, um, maybe they break up with a boyfriend or girlfriend or have roommate problems. Whenever they hear the drumming, they start smiling and really getting into it. I just joined in, didn't really know too much about it. First time I got a chance to get involved with my culture. Like last year I was living in San Diego, so there's like no, they didn't even know what Eskimo is, you know. So got a chance to get involved with it. Just hopped in and started learning the songs and dances. Awesome. Feels good dancing in front of all the people because a lot of people don't got the guts to do that. Stand up in front of a whole bunch of people and dance to your native tradition. Some people are ashamed or something. It's nothing to be ashamed of. People say I'm really into my dance. Um, I just relax, I dance, and it's pretty cool and pretty fun. I was trying not to think so hard on how the moves go, because you mess up and stuff like that if you just think too hard. It's just my opportunities to 
how much my horizons have broadened. They're getting so much bigger and bigger. I mean, I pull to my pull my grades together. I can go to like Georgetown or Southern California University, of Southern California. Or I could go to a big school, and I'm gonna too. I'm gonna go to school out of state, somewhere get to know something else besides of Alaska. Get to travel a little more. It's broadening my horizon so much, and got a big opportunity to stay away from drugs and having kids when I'm like 18 be here and just be safe, make my parents proud. Just having so much opportunities to go traveling and having all these doors open from here and now I'd have back at home. Because at home you're just like in this little space and you're not even able to do much. Then coming here, it's like, wow, it's really lots of fun. As you can see, attending Mount Edgecombe means opportunities. Opportunities to work in leadership positions as well as opportunities outside of school. From generation to generation, this prestigious high school keeps producing a caliber of graduating students that are prepared and anxious to pursue their goals outside the doors of Mount Edgecombe High School. Thank you for joining us as we take you across the state learning more about our native youth. We here at This Generation look forward to bringing you more great stories from America's native youth. Until then, God bless and goodbye. To purchase a VHS copy of this program, have your credit card number ready and call area code 907-563-7440 or mail $20 check or money order to Jeannie Green Productions, 6216 Old Seward Highway, Anchorage, Alaska 99518. Ask for the program number listed below.